in the United States, there's only five cities that don't need to process their water, meaning really, really filter their water prior to moving to the tap. Everybody else, we are drinking chlorine or chloramine in our water, period. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to episode number 116 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, we're going to talk all about how toxins found in water could be part of what's impacting your skin. But before we dive into that conversation, I want to give a shout out to one of our listeners. Akaretka shared a really awesome review over on iTunes, which I deeply appreciate, describing the show as vital to our healing journey. Quote, I absolutely love this podcast. I find the interviews and information succinct, informative, and above all, useful. It's a relief and a blessing to have come across such a great show, the information from which I can directly incorporate into my son's healing journey. Thank you for the podcast and also for the annual summits. End quote. Wow, that is so awesome to hear. I am so glad that the information that we share here is helpful for you because that's ultimately the point. I love sharing information that I find that I believe could be critical to you or someone you love on their journey to rebuild healthy skin. Now, since today's interview went a bit on the long side, I want to hop right into things. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I've got a great guest with me today. Some of you may remember her from the 2019 Eczema and Psoriasis Awareness Week. We're going to dive into this whole issue about chlorine in your water. Can it be harmful or um, just detrimental to your skin? We've got a lot of things to talk about. My guest today is Laura Adler. She's an environmental toxins expert and educator and a certified health coach who teaches nutritionists, nurses, and other holistic practitioners how to eliminate the number one thing holding their clients back from the results they are seeking, the unaddressed link between chemicals and chronic health problems. She trains practitioners to become experts in everyday toxic exposures so they can improve client outcomes without spending hundreds of hours researching on their own. Combining environmental health education and business consulting, she's helped thousands of health professionals in over 25 countries around the world elevate their skill set, improve client outcomes, and become sought-out leaders in the growing environmental health and detoxification field. Lara, thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be here and thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, I think the first question that I have for you is chlorine as predominantly found in water. A lot of people know that there can be chlorine in water, but do you think that people realize how many water systems across the country have chlorine in them, and should we be concerned about chlorine? I think it's a good place to begin. Yeah. So, you know, most water in developed countries is chlorinated, um, or at least it's treated in a number of different ways to combat um, the potential for, you know, microbial or bacterial um, overgrowth in the water so that we're not spreading communicable diseases like cholera or dysentery, uh, uh, or typhoid, which are, you know, were classic diseases that were passed through the water and the advent of water chlorination solves those problems. So on that front, chlorine is great, but the reality is that we have chlorine residues in our drinking water um, that may be problematic for all of us for a number of different reasons. Um, so, you know, I think the, the vast majority of people are going to have either chlorine or chloramine, which is a combination of chlorine and ammonia in their um, municipal water and their city water. Uh, And chlorine is easier to remove and address. Chloramine is actually harder to remove and to address. So wait, would we be Chlorine has that like classic chlorine smell. Yes. Would we be drinking this chloramine? This isn't our drinking water. I I Yeah, I mean, we're drinking it. Yes. I mean, we are consuming it. Wow. That's pretty yeah. shocking. Okay. So chlorine and ammonia. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting mix. 
Yeah, and you know, it's it's hailed as like, you know, one of the greatest achievements of the 21st century. Water chlorination is this great thing that we have instituted because it it really helps to kind of put the kibosh on a lot of those communicable diseases. And there's always been that like risk benefit analysis, like, well, a little bit of chlorine in the water is not bad because the payoff is big because we're not getting dysentery when we drink our water. Mm -hmm. That seems good. However, um, you know, there's so many layers deep we can go in this conversation, but I'm going to start with the sort of fundamentals um, of why I think this is concerning for us is you know, whether we're drinking the water or bathing in it. So like, for example, showering, mm -hmm. um, if our water has chlorine in it, then we're showering in chlorine, not the same amount that you'll find in a swimming pool. But um, some studies have found that about 50% of our daily chlorine intake actually comes from the shower. It's not what we're drinking. So chlorine is a volatile gas that volatizes in the steam, hot steam of the shower. So we're breathing it in and it's really easily absorbed through our skin. Now, for people that are maybe competitive swimmers or they're just swimming as their form of exercise, they very often have um, skin issues mm -hmm. because of the amount of time that they spend in the chlorine. And part of that comes from the fact that chlorine is stripping all of those really beneficial natural oils that help protect our skin. Um, the chlorine is actually stripping that away. So, the my gosh, because the chlorine in where I live, for example, or I should say the water where I live, smells so heavily of chlorine, I can't even bear to drink the water unless I put it through my... Berkey style countertop filter thing because it's so nauseating the odor and so you're saying it doesn't even matter about drinking that water literally the act of showering because between the heat and everything you're then absorbing it through your skin more so in the shower than even drinking it potentially yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know about more, so maybe it's about 50-50, but, wow. you know, like I said, 50% of our intake is coming from the few minutes that we spend in the shower. Okay. And then the rest is coming from, you know, the, the foods uh, and water, primarily the water that we're drinking. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and there's, again, there's, it's this balance between like, okay, chlorination has solved other problems, but it's also causing problems. So one of those problems like I mentioned is, you know, it certainly can lead to skin issues and exacerbation of existing skin issues because it's stripping that um, uh, natural oil layer in our skin from our skin. But um, it can also disrupt the natural microbiome of our skin. Like, and what's fascinating to me, and I was just reading this recently, is that different parts of our Skin, like the skin on our scalp is different than the skin, the microbiome um, profile of the skin on our scalp is different than the skin under our arms that's different than our feet. And if we think about the purpose of water chlorination, it's to kill bacteria. That's mm -hmm. why it's there. And our microbiome is nothing but and if ideally beneficial bacteria, or maybe if somebody has, you know, whether it's alopecia and there's some, dis, you know, there's more of one type of bacteria than the other, um, then it stands to reason that water chlorination, when we're exposed to this chlorine water, that it might disrupt the, the natural microbiome of our skin which is going to potentially weaken the integrity of the skin or kind of crack open the door for maybe some inflammatory skin issues or any other kind of issues, even just like dryness. Well, can I ask you a question? Because um, I've had another guest on who talked about the issues with uh, fluorinated water. So is it one or the yes. other or do they tend to go hand in hand depending on the community, like where they will both fluorinate and chlorinate? the drinking water? Yes. So almost, I, I, there's very, very few exceptions um, to this. But in fact, I think in the United States, there's only five cities 
that don't need to process their water, meaning uh, really, really filter their water prior to moving to the tap. Everybody else, we are drinking chlorine or chloramine in our water, period. That's purpose is for sanitation. Mm -hmm. So there's not ever going to be an instance where um, uh, some form of sanitation, whether it's chlorination or chloramination or some other um, compound, maybe it's treated with UV, maybe it's pushed through an RO system, which is unlikely in a, on a city scale. Um, uh, so there's always going to be some type of chlorine or chloramine. And then fluoride is... Um, at, it's either intentionally added, um, not for the purpose of disinfection, but for the purpose of allegedly uh, trying to reduce the amount of dental caries or cavities in that community. Um, although there's a very hot debate mm. about the research in that space, um, even if a city doesn't intentionally add fluoride chemicals to the drinking water, there may be naturally present fluoride if the geography of where you live happens to be rich in fluorine elements in, in the earth's crust in that area. Um, but it's also worth noting, and maybe this is a whole nother topic is that the, you know, when we think about fluoride in our toothpaste, it's sodium fluoride. Um, sodium fluoride is not what's added to municipal drinking water. It's a chemical called sodium fluorosicilic acid or fluorosicilic acid. And it is a byproduct of the aluminum industry. It is a, a toxic waste. It is not the same thing that dentists are using in the dental office. But fluoride, any fluorine, fluorinated compound, as well as any chlorinated compound, as well as any brominated compound, um, they're all halogenated chemicals. So if we go back to chemistry cap class and we look at the periodic table of elements, they're all in the halogen column uh, along with iodine. And we know that iodine is really necessary for the health of the thyroid. And what happens is any compounds that are chlorinated, fluorinated, or brominated will displace iodine in the thyroid. And so they can lead to all of these um, health effects that are associated with um, suppressed thyroid function or lowered thyroid function or just not not fully functional thyroid um, system. And that's, you know, something to consider when we're looking at things like fluorinated water that has the potential to kind of disrupt the thyroid. So as far as chlorinated water is concerned, you know, one question that I frequently get is, is it safe? So say someone has eczema, is it safe for me to go in a pool? Like, if I'm going to be exposed to this chlorine, is this potentially going to flare my eczema? So, is the, so you're saying that the concentration of chlor, chlorine or chlora, whatever the other chemical is, or, I mean, is a lot, is a lot, would be less than what's in a chlorinated pool. So, y if you go in yes. a pool, you're going to be exposed to a much, like, what is, do you know what the difference is between, like, tap water versus, like, a recall. pool? No, I don't recall, you know, I was just actually listening because I'm a nerd. I listen to podcasts on stuff <laughs> like this. I was listening to a podcast on pool um, chlorination because that's interesting <laughs> to a very small group of people. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 what's really interesting is if you're in a, a, you know, a pool that's part of a school or a community center or YMCA or whatever, um, those type of more commercial pool systems do actually have uh, devices that measure the parts per million of chlorine in the water and will adjust the sort of dosing of the pool with more chlorine accordingly so that it stays within um, a specific range. But when people have backyard pools, they typically don't have that's those same sort of more expensive devices to measure the chlorine levels. So, you know, people with backyard pools may very well have way higher levels of chlorine than they would if they went to the city or towns, you know, local swimming, swimming pools. And so you could, you could obviously ask the local pool then what the level of chlorine is that they're, they're going by. Yes. Yes. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's it very much is a balance. Right. So if people like what I always say is, look, if if swimming is the m method of exercise that people 
works well for them or if they have an injury and they're like, look, all I can do is be in the pool. I don't want to tell people like you can't ever right. swim in a pool. But if you're also dealing with something like eczema or any skin issue where you've got a compromised skin, uh, compromised skin, you know, like maybe that combination isn't ideal. Um, and I've also heard, heard people suggesting that you, you know, put coconut oil all over your skin. I know you have thoughts about coconut oil yeah. um, in the skin already, but I've heard people say that like, oh, just lather up and coat yourself in some oil before you go into the pool. But here's why I don't think that that's wise. So chlorine on its own is a problem, but when chlorine reacts in, uh, when chlorine is in the presence of organic matter that's in the water, which is like microscopic, you know, leaves, dust, hair, coconut oil, what happens is in the presence of this organic matter, the chlorine converts into compounds that are sort of classified as disinfection byproducts. So it is a byproduct of the disinfection process. And these chemicals are referred to as trihalomethanes or haloacetic acids. And these chemicals are carcinogens. Oh, wow. Yeah. So your water quality report not only is monitoring how much chlorine, but it's also monitoring how much of these trihalomethanes or haloacetic acids are present. And for people who, you know, get their water quality report in the mail and they just kind of throw it out and put it in the recycle bin, I encourage them to look at it because all of their water quality reports will actually have a warning for people that are immunocompromised, um, that are elderly, that might have, you know, infants um, to actually not drink the water because it has these trihalomethanes um, in them. And, you know, so I, I was mentioning earlier that, you know, most cities are using chlorine. The, the big objection to chlorine is the smell, right? Like nobody, I mean, I was at a restaurant recently and they served what might as well have been pool water, like one sip. And I was like, I can't drink. That's awful. Um, so like, that's the big objection is the smell and the taste. We don't like it. So cities have been switching um, quite rapidly to chloramine, which again is the chlorine plus ammonia. And that combination, not it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have the strong odor that chlorine has. So there's two problems with chlorine. One, it has um, uh, the smell. And then two, it dissipates quickly. It's very volatile. So that's, again, why, like, in the shower, we're breathing it in, um, which means that it doesn't stay in the water distribution system for a really long time, meaning from the water treatment plant all the way through the pipes in your city, all the way to your house. So chloramine solves both of those problems because it doesn't have a strong odor or taste and it stays in the distribution system a lot longer and it produces less of those trihalomethanes. However, the ones it does produce are more toxic and chloramine is much harder to remove from the water. So it's like in, you know, in the space around environmental chemicals, we always talk about regrettable substitutions where we you know, malign some chemical for being bad or having some detriments. And then we go, well, I'm going to replace it with this one. And then, you know, like some point in time later, we're like, wow, wow, that one's just as crap as the first one, <laughs> you know? And, and then we just keep going through this cycle of it's like whack-a-mole. We whack one down and another one comes up in his, in its place. So, you know, basically neither one of these, substances are great in our water and we want to filter them out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think that the concern is one, that we have this disrupted skin microbiome um, that we can possibly be drying out or exacerbating skin conditions that we have, but we also have the skin in our inside, right? We don't just have skin on the outside. And so when we're drinking this chlorinated water and we're introducing these really small amounts of compounds that are intended to kill bacteria, it stands to reason that it may have some effect on the gut, you know, the population of, of microbes, good and bad, um, in our gut. And so it can interfere with our gut micro microbiome. And, you know, that's obviously a, pretty significant pillar when it comes to overall health, not just our skin, but literally everything else. Yeah. Well, I, I think, 
you know, as we're kind of like, because there's a lot to unpack here, um, I definitely want to make sure, too, that we give people some actionable steps here. So, number one, if somebody is using a pool or they go in a pool, what is the best thing that they can do when they're done in the pool? So, uh, good question. So, the... um before they even get in the pool, my recommendation is when you're choosing a pool, if you have the option of being in an outdoor pool, choose that over an indoor pool because you know when you walk into a, an enclosed pool room and it just chlorine smell is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You don't have that with outdoor pools because the chlorine is able to dissipate and it doesn't get stuck inside this building. Um, and you, there are certainly you know pools that have... Um, pool rooms that have better ventilation than others. So just look for one where when you walk in, you're not like immediately struck by how strong it smells of chlorine. Mm -hmm. So one, that's a good choice. Um, I encourage people, there's a lot of places that are advertising like salt, um, salt water pools. It's just chlorine. Instead of adding chlorine, salt actually produces chlorine, sodium chloride. Like it's not, it's, it's just, that's, it's still chlorine. Okay. So it's a uh, very much marketing, um, to say like, I have a saltwater pool. You have a chlorinated pool. It's the same, <laughs> the same thing. Um, so, uh, that's, I think the biggest piece of advice. Um, you know, the other thing is really just making sure that you're hydrating, um, afterwards to help, you know, maybe flush some of that stuff out. I don't really know if there is an identified, um, sort of, uh, uh, intervention mm -hmm. around what do we do after. Um, I've definitely heard of people saying, oh, make sure that you're taking some vitamin C. Vitamin C um, helps to disassociate chlorine so that it just becomes sodium chloride. Then it just, it's, and it's benign and it's fine. Um, that works in a glass of water. It might work in a bathtub. I don't know if that actually works inside the human body. And what about rinsing off after you get out of a pool? Is that a good idea? Do it. Do it. Okay. Yes. A hundred percent. Okay. I mean, look, you know, it's, and you know, like when you go someplace and th there's a ton of chlorine and you come home and your hair and your skin stinks of chlorine, your clothes stink of chlorine. Like you, we want to wash this stuff off mm -hmm. um, as much as possible. It is still going to absorb while we're in the water. And I don't know if there's any real interventions that we can do to prevent that absorption. I think we just want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're getting it out. And I think, you know, sauna certainly wouldn't hurt if you're at a gym that has a pool and a sauna. Great. Do your laps and then get into the shower off, get into the sauna. Maybe you can sweat some of that stuff out that you have absorbed. Um, and because that's really one of the things that sauna is great for is helping, um, excrete the toxins that are sitting in our subcutaneous fat. Um, and if we're absorbing things through our skin, we should be able to excrete things through our skin. And then I think the one last question, because this really has to do with more showering, because we've talked a bit about that and this whole issue of like, you're in the shower, what do you do? Is there a shower head or a filtration system for the shower head that you could get that you found is helpful? Yeah, I mean, so there's, uh, if people don't have the ability or means to have a whole house water filtration system, you know, if you're a renter or if you don't have the budget for it, fine. That's obviously ideal because then you can remove the chlorine from the source and you don't actually have to worry about anything in your shower, which is wonderful. Um, for everyone else, uh, I do think that having a, a shower filter um, is pretty important just to help remove some of that chlorine. Now, most of the shower filters on the market are generally the same. And the reason they're the same is because there's only one or two types of filter media, filtration media that can tolerate the high temperature of hot water and the volume of water, the high water flow. So, you know, you think of a Brita and the water just like drip, drip, drips down because it's moving really slowly through that media. Um, we would not want to have our shower be that way too. Yeah. So it has to go really fast. And the faster the water goes through the media, the less um, it's going to be able to actually remove the media is actually going to be able to remove anything. So shower filters are going to be activated charcoal. Um, they might have a material called KDF, um, which are pretty standard to have those in combination. They're all pretty much the same. They're all about, you know, 50 to $80 
Um, just look for those compounds. You can also find vitamin C filters. So I was talking earlier about vitamin C. You can get a vitamin C filter, but all it's going to do is convert the chlorine, um, take out, take out, essentially render the chlorine um, um, a non-issue, but it doesn't do anything about the trihalomethanes or the haloacetic acids or any of those other compounds that might be in the water. And even the activated charcoal ones, they're just reducing it. They're not eliminating it. It's just not possible with the water flow and the high temperature. So it's like better than nothing, um, which is why I think everybody should have one, um, especially if there's any kind of skin issue or any kind of thyroid hormone issue going on because it is a chlorinated compound. If you have chloramine in your shower, those filters are really only going to reduce it a little bit because they just, they don't, it's not the right type of charcoal. So with the best thing me. to do is go back to your water company, get the most recent report and yep. find out what is actually in the water so you can address that appropriately. Yeah. I mean, and that's really easy to do. You can just Google like the name of your town or city and the words water quality report. It's also called a consumer confidence report. Um, and your municipality is required by law to produce these every year. They usually are released about June, July, August. Some are just like a white paper with a bunch of figures on it. Others are like these really beautifully designed brochures with pictures of reservoirs and people drinking water. Um, that all depends on the budget of the town or city in which you live. Um, but they will tell you whether or not there is chlorine or chloramine. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I feel like we have so much to talk about on like the topic of toxins in general. Yeah. So I'd love to have you back some other time because I feel like we could only we could only cram so much into this. That said, for everybody who's listening, you definitely need to go to Lara's site, uh, laraadler.com. She's also got a great Instagram page as well, which I'll link everything up there. And you've got a really nice gift for everybody, which when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And it's, a, it's totally free to download. Um, we'll put the links for all of that. It's your, your top 10 toxins, right, to be on the lookout for. It was really incredible yeah. when I took a look at it. I was like, wow, this is, this is fantastic. I learned a ton from it. So I think it'd be a great place for everybody uh, listening to, to, to dive into. And of course, Laura, we're going to have you back. Got to do it. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Such an eye-opening conversation. Am I right? I'm so glad that Laura was willing to come here and share this information with you guys. She knows a ton about toxins and toxic exposures. So we'll have to have her come back to talk a lot more about toxins and how that can impact your skin. If you have any questions or comments, head on over to skinterrupt.com forward slash 116 in order to leave your comments, thoughts, and questions so that we can keep the conversation going. And I would love if you'd head on over to your podcast platform of choice, rate and review the show, and then hit the subscribe button. That way, the next episode will land on your mobile device without you having to do a thing. And if you know someone who would find this episode absolutely fascinating, because frankly, all of us are exposed to water, make sure to share this episode with them. Sharing is caring. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.